Hi, welcome back to McClatchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClatchy and today I'm going to be taking you through some more decision mathematics. This is part two of my video series introducing you to decision mathematics by looking at critical paths, float times, network diagrams, earlier start times, later start times, and we're introducing into this activity the concept of dummy edges and activities. Now this is part of Unit 4 of Year 12 General Maths. I hope you're enjoying this series, stay with me, and I hope you've got your erasable pen or lead pencil ready so that you can draw along the activity with me. Now sometimes when we draw a process it's not as easy as it was in my first video. That was a fairly straightforward process. It had a couple of simultaneous activities. But sometimes we've got some simultaneous activities taking place where they've got different or common predecessors but they're not all the same. Now that sounds like a bit of a mouthful. It's a lot easier to see it when you see it on your screen or on paper. So let's have a little look at what would happen. So in this activity chart, fairly straightforward, activities A, B, C, D, E, so not a lot going on here. I could start by drawing activity B and C. They are going to be simultaneous activities with the same predecessor A, so not a problem. We knew how to do that from our last video. But the problem lies after we've drawn activity E, it's only got the one predecessor C, but I've got activity D left to insert and it has two predecessors B and C and E only had the one, which was C. So how do I draw this? Well, I could start by maybe drawing it coming out of B, but that wouldn't be exactly correct, would it? Because D and E do happen at the same time, but this particular diagram shows that D only has one predecessor, but it's in fact got two. So that's not gonna work. This won't be correct either. I could try and create some sort of a circuit, but that is indicating now that C and D are the two predecessors of E, but we know that E's only got one predecessor, so that doesn't work either. So this is where we insert something called a dummy activity, and we indicate that with a blank edge. I've drawn that in for you in red, but you don't need to draw that in a different color. A dummy activity has a duration of zero, or if we were drawing a network using costs, it would have a cost of zero and we draw it using dashed lines. Now the dummy activity is clearly showing that E has just one predecessor and D has two. So if you follow that little pathway, you can see exactly what's going on with that process. We also leave the dummy activity edge blank. We don't need to draw it and label it with a letter. We don't need to give it a time of zero. That's all assumed knowledge. So are you ready to start with a bit more complicated example than this one? Because we're gonna bake a cake. Now in this particular example, you can look straight down there. We've got, uh, I think it's 11 activities to put into an activity chart. And we've got a couple of those that are gonna be causing a problem for us. And that's activity D and C. You see activity D, creaming our butter with our sugar, has two immediate predecessors. We've firstly gotta take the butter out of the oven before, so butter out of the fridge to soften it before we can mix that up with the sugar. And I don't know if you've ever tried to mix it when it's cold, it makes an absolute mess. I've done that myself. And then we have to also measure our ingredients and when we've done that, we can sift our flour. So we can be sifting our flour while the butter and the sugar are creaming together, but because they don't have identical predecessors, D and E are gonna need a dummy edge. So let's get started by drawing it. So our step, first step is we're gonna draw that starting vertex in the middle of our available space on the left-hand side. Now. There it is there. Step two, we're gonna have all our activities without predecessors extending from that vertex. Now, in this particular video, I'm actually gonna draw, because we've got a few of these activities that are gonna come out of here, A, B, C, and H. So I'm gonna leave some of those very simple activities, preheating the oven, activity A, and preparing the cake tin, activity H, till later on in the, in the um, video, once we've worked out where the space is gonna be available. And you can do the same thing, put your more complicated uh, activities and processes through the middle and then add your parallel edges later on. So let's start with B and C. They're our first two parallel processes. Softening the butter, measuring the ingredients. And I'm gonna move C down a little bit so I've got a bit more space. So that's why those erasable pens come in handy. Now, activity C is a predecessor for sifting the flour. So we can draw that one in fairly easily. But creaming the butter relies on two predecessors, B and C. So here's where I'm gonna put my dummy activity in after C so that I can display that information. And there's activity D coming out of there. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop in my next activity, which is gonna be adding the eggs to the mix. 
And because that now creates the end of that, that parallel process, C and E, um, they're all going to be putting the flour into the cake mix now. So we can bring that along. And we're going to flat add that flour and fold it in. Now I'm going to start adding in those other activities that come out of my initial vertex. I've got activity H, which was preparing the cake tin. And this is the point where I actually need to start pouring the cake mix into the cake tin. And I'm going to pop preheat the oven in. That was my very first activity as well that took place alongside activities H, B and C. And now that the oven is hot, I can put the cake into the oven and then I can remove it from the oven and let it cool and then eat it, which is my favourite part. Okay, let's do some calculating with our network that we've created. First of all, we want to find the earliest start time of the whole process. So firstly, as per my previous video, you're going to split each vertex in half. And then what we're going to do is move along each process um, a little by little. We're going to write that earliest start time into the left hand side because we're forward scanning. And if we find that there's no immediate predecessor, the value will be zero. So there, there we go with our first um, little bubble, our first vertex, and its value is zero. That's the start time of the whole process, time zero. And now I'm going to come along and I'm going to add the previous vertices together. It's a cumulative effect and always selecting when I get multiple different edges converging at one different vertex, I take the largest choice. So we can see this is going to happen at a few different points before activity D, activity G, activity I and activity J. We're all going to have to make decisions at each of these points. So firstly, I'm going to come along the bottom of my network. Activity C, fairly straightforward, takes five minutes. And then I've got my choice at activity D. Do I choose the number for B or do I choose C? Well, activity B took 15 minutes versus activity C, which only takes five. So I put the largest choice, 15, into the vertex's left-hand side. Okay, then I'm going to move along. I'm going to add three minutes for activity D. And now I've got a new choice. Do I add three minutes for activity F? Or do I come back along the bottom process, C and E, for six minutes? Well, of course, I'll make the largest choice, which will be 21 minutes. Then again, I have another decision at the activity I. Do I add a minute to 21 or do I insert two minutes? Well, of course, I'm going to add the one minute to 21 minutes and take the largest choice. Moving along again to the right-hand side, when I've completed activity I, I can either add two minutes to 22 or... I can choose the top activity, which was preheating the oven. 20 minutes will, once again, make the largest choice. 22 plus 2 is 24. And then we don't have any more different edges rejoining at vertices anymore. It's fairly straightforward to the end. Add 30 minutes, add 30 minutes again. So now I need to write a statement. I've found that the earliest start time is 84 minutes. What that means is, is if I do everything exactly on time, it's going to take me exactly 84 minutes to complete the process of baking and cooling my cake, or an hour and 24 minutes. And I would recommend if you go over 60 minutes, you should always express in hours and minutes. Same as if you go past 24 hours, you should express in days and hours. Now I need to find the critical path and that's the longest route through the process and we found that when we chose through each of those different vertices where the edges were joining we chose to go across the middle that was the critical path B D F G I J K and usually as you're pulling together those um, times in your little bubbles um, your vertices you're going to be able to work out straight away which is the critical path because you're choosing that path each way along. The next question now is to find the float time of activity A. Remember, these are all the activities that are not on the critical path. We don't have float time on the critical path. So this is how long I can delay different activities before 84 minutes blows out. Now the first activity A is preheating my oven. So I can delay that a certain amount of time before I delay the whole project. That's a 20 minute activity. So if I start preheating that at time zero, that means the oven will be ready to put a cake inside it at 20 minutes. But that's four minutes before I actually need to put the cake in the oven because I'm not quite ready yet. So activity J starts at the 24 minute mark. That means I've got four minutes float time on activity A. So what that's effectively saying is I could delay turning the oven on for up to four minutes, anywhere up to four minutes, and I'm still going to be able to have my cake made by the 84 minute mark. 
The question is now asking me to find the float time of activity H. H was preparing my cake tin and that takes me two minutes. I actually don't need the cake tin until activity I. So 22 take away two gives me 20 minutes. So I can delay preparing my cake tin for as long as 20 minutes and I'm still gonna be able to make my cake on time. The question is now asking me to find the float time of activity C, which was measuring my ingredients. Now that takes five minutes and the sugar doesn't get kneaded until the butter's soft at the 15 minute mark. So that means that the float time of activity C is 15 take away five or 10 minutes. And now we need to find the float time of activity, activity E, which was sifting the flour. Now it only takes one minute and I don't need it until time 21. So I could be delaying that as much as 15 minutes into the whole process. So 15 um, minutes was calculated as 21 take away six. Now you'd be asking yourself, well, hang on a minute. It only takes a minute to sip the flour. Why not 21 take away one? Well, the thing is I can't sip the flour until I've measured the flour. So that five minutes plus the one minutes gets added to calculate the float time of sifting the flour or activity E. So 21 take away six gives me a float time of 15 minutes. Now I'm asked to find the latest start time for each of my different activities. Remember once again, these are for activities not on the critical path. And I calculate this as earliest completion time take away the time for the activity. Now remember, the earliest completion time is always gonna be 84 minutes. We calculated that earlier on in the video. So the, early, the latest start time for process A is going to be four minutes. 24 take away 20. The latest start time for process C is 10 minutes, 15 take away five. So this is 10 minutes into the overall process. The, active, the latest start time for process CE is 15 minutes, 21 take away six. And the latest start time for process H is 20 minutes, 22 take away two. Now, We've talked a little bit about dummy activities and when we would use those. There are other circumstances where we might need to use a dummy activity. And this is typically for computer programming. I'm just gonna to talk to you very briefly about this and we may need to use this information later on in our decision mathematics uh, program. So ideally, in networks that are going to be done by a computer program, we want to avoid the use of parallel edges between the same two vertices and I'll show you why. It causes problems for computer programming because computers work off vertex labels, not edge labels. Now, everything we've done to date has been labeling our edges A5, B8, C3, but the computer needs vertex labels. And so each vertex is labeled with a number and it reads those labels as a process one, two or two, three. So you can see here that activity B and activity C would both be called 2-3 by the computer and that would create some problems because it would not understand that they're both two different things happening at the same time. So this is where we insert dummy edges and the dummy edge is given and the vertex that we create coming out of that dummy edge gets given a number as well. So now activity A would be called by the computer 1-2, activity B would be called 2-4 and activity uh, C would be called 2-3. So this avoids that whole problem and our dummy edge once again has no duration. Well that's all we've got time for today. I hope this has been a helpful series. I will be creating more on decision mathematics as time goes on. So please like and subscribe to the channel so that when I do create those videos, you'll be able to hear about it first. Have a wonderful day and I hope you're enjoying this beautiful weather.